Thank you, worship team, for leading us in our, our time before the Lord. And for preparing our hearts for worship. It's good to be with you, church. I remember some faces. Uh, other faces are new, which means that you don't know me. And you may not want to know me. Um, that's why I get asked to preach at a lot of places once. And um, uh, no, seriously, I've been here a number of times over the years. Uh, actually, I was uh, uh, joking with uh, Pastor Josh that uh, I was actually scheduled to preach one of the Sundays when an opportunity opened up for him to candidate here at the church. And I got canceled <laughs> just so they could just so they could hear him and hire him. I mean, what's up with that, church? Come on. Um, but it was a joy to, uh, to finally meet him this morning. And, and Josh, thank you for, for sharing your pulpit uh, with me this morning. Um, and yes, we are still trying to figure out what in the world a professor emeritus is. Uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's a title. I know I've been around a long time. Uh, I... Um, I was alive before the Dead Sea uh, died, and so they just don't know what to do with uh, with pastors or professors who who hit that age. And I'm glad that Pastor uh, Pastor Tim has found a a, a nice um, way to continue his effective ministry. And um, but I really am enjoying this uh, phase of life. And for those of you who do know me, um, you know that every time I come, I talk about a land or lands that I love. Um, I speak of the Bible lands. Most people call Israel the land of the Bible. Uh, it's one of the lands of the Bible. So let's get that straight. Israel, Palestine, Turkey, Greece. Uh, Jordan, Egypt, and that's not naming all of them. These are all lands that I've been able, I've had the joy of being able to visit and take people to, and this has become one of the, the passions in these days, in this season of my life, that I continue to do. And um, I, I'm not making a big promo this morning, but I've got a number of um, trips for uh, 2024. Uh, it, Five weeks from today, I will be in the land again with a group of 40, uh, and uh, was just there in May uh, with a group of 22, uh, trips in 2024, a uh, number, uh, let's see, I have four trips in 2024, and I'm talking with people about trips in 2025. So I love the opportunity to take people to the lands of the Bible. It changes your life. That's all I'm going to say about that. And there are some brochures on the uh, uh, front seat if you have any interest and would like to know where I go and why. I promise you, we'll go to some places that no tours ever go. That's my promise to you. We'll pull into a lot of places that are loaded with tour buses, and we'll go to a lot of places where there are no tour buses because no tours go there. Um, and so I call them... Um, Imagine pilgrimages, um, hoping that this is a tour with more than uh, what people expect. So today, uh, with that backdrop of my love for the land, I'd like to take you back to Israel with me in a portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 13, a very familiar portion of Scripture. And again, if you've been with me before, uh, or sat under my teaching, you know that I love to take some passages of Scripture and see if there's something new that we can glean out of a familiar passage. And I'd like to do that again today with uh, this, this passage, which we refer to as the parable of the sower. Now, if you were to go to Israel with me, and let me just describe one of the places that we go to. It's a place called Nazareth Village. And uh, Nazareth Village is a recreation of a first century working farm. 
And there are people both in costume and there is a combination of some recreations and also some archaeological artifacts. And one of the occasions when we were there, our Arab guide by the name of Amir uh, was walking us through and from time to time he would pause and make us look down at the path. And each time he did that, he uncovered another element of this very familiar parable for us. Now, if you're a Bible scholar and a theologian, you may know that this portion of the Gospel of Matthew is often referred to as the parabolic discourse because Jesus strings out eight or nine different parables that he goes through in a row and he's talking about one theme. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And he talks and teaches about things that were familiar to his listeners. He did everything possible to connect with those who sat and listened to him. He used object lessons that people would see every day and be reminded when they saw it that there was a spiritual lesson there to be learned. And this passage is a great illustration of that. Now, in the passage, there are a couple of things that we're going to zero in on. We're going to talk about the sower, we're going to talk about the seed, and we're going to talk about the soil, which everyone in this agrarian society in century one, they all understood it because they had to grow their own food. It wasn't just a little garden in the back of your yard. This was what you had to do to survive. In sowing, the landowner held a container of seed in one hand, and with his other hand, he would just simply toss the seed. And then after he had done so, he would cultivate the soil again, turning the seed under the soil in hope that it would bring a good harvest. So while the story that Jesus is telling makes perfect sense, it was unclear to the disciples why he was telling the story. And the disciples, after Jesus tells the parable, uh, they, they said to him, um, Jesus, we're, we're, not, we're not sure why you told this story. And so Jesus does something that he didn't always do when he told parables. He explained exactly what it meant. So you'll have to forgive me this morning. And in Matthew 13, we're going to jump around a bit because I want to move through this passage in a topical manner of the four soils that Jesus talks about. And we're going to tell you what Jesus said in the parable, and then we'll tell you what Jesus said as he explained it to the disciples. And then we'll move to the second soil, do the same, and then with the third and the fourth. But the disciples did want to know, and in verse 10 they ask him, why do you speak in parables? There were a whole lot of people listening. If you look at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus was on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and as was often the case, people would swarm to come and hear him. And so he had no choice because he couldn't go anywhere. His back was against the lake. And so he borrowed a boat. They put out just a little ways into the lake, and he simply taught from the boat as the people listened. I don't know how many of you have been to the Sea of Galilee or, or understand the geography and topography of the land, but the acoustics of being able to speak in an area where there was water, the sound bounced more easily to the crowd so that everyone could hear clearly. Some truth was commonly known in one realm. They understood what sowing seed was all about, but Jesus was going to take this seed sowing to a whole new level because he wanted the people and the disciples to understand 
But yes, there was a physical understanding that everyone would connect to. But he wanted them to understand the spiritual implications as well. So in the context of this passage, Jesus says in verse 3, he told them many things in parables. And if you like Bible trivia, this is the very first time that the word parable is used in Scripture. Now what we're going to do I'm going to identify the verses, but I'm not going to read them in order, as I said, but I'll identify the verses that I'm reading from so that you can follow along in your version. Um, I'm using the ESV, so it may be slightly different in my version than it is in yours. And we are not advancing. Okay, could we advance one slide, please? Thank you. Okay, we'll just pause there for a moment, and uh, let's pray before we talk about the hardened soil. Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart uh, be acceptable in your sight this morning. Father, I pray that the chaff that comes out of my mouth would simply be forgotten or blown away, and would pray that truth would take root in our hearts. That is my prayer, and I would ask that each of us consider the seriousness of what Jesus taught as it relates to our own lives, and that we would be able to determine where we fall in the description of the soils. And I pray this for our good, for your glory, in the name of the beautiful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. All right, so let's talk about the hardened soil. And we see it in verses 3 and 4. And then also it's explained in verse 19. So verses 3 and 4, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came down and devoured it. Okay, now right away, I've got to hit the pause button and explain first century farming, okay? Now, we live, we live in an agrarian part of the county. Uh, we all know, and in fact, some of you may be farmers. I don't know that for a fact. But I'm pretty sure of the fact that most of you who might be farmers or who know a farmer, who have been to a farm, you know that there is a house and a barn, and then you've got all the acreage around the house. And so it's easy to get to the, the farm, the land that you owned with the equipment that you owned. That's not the way they did it in the first century. All the villages were grouped together in a particular area, and then all of the fields were outside of the village. Well, how did you know whose field belonged to whom? Well, that was because of the hardened paths. It was like a crisscross. It was like a path that, that we sometimes see in, in our own farms right here in Lancaster County. You'll see a, a road that goes usually not through the field, but maybe around the field so the farmer can get his tractor from point A to point B. Well, just imagine... In the first century, everyone is walking, and they've got paths which not only get you from field to field, but they also served as the boundary markers of whose field belongs to whom. It was also a place sometimes where you could put up a boundary marker, often marked simply by piles of rocks. And so the paths were for walking the circumference of a person's land identifying what land they owned. And they didn't want to walk through the fields because we all know that that would damage the standing grain. Now, these paths, simply from walking on them, 
became compacted soil. Well, when the farmers were plowing before the season, before the planting of the seed, inevitably, as they were tossing it back and forth, or sometimes with the help of a gust of wind, the seed would go someplace that it really didn't have a chance to survive. The hardened soil. And so, even though someone was walking through the fields, they were often walking on the paths to get from point A to point B, from village to village, to field, to field, to countryside. And so we have situations such as we find in some of the other gospel passages where Jesus and his disciples are, it says they're walking through a field. Well, what does that mean? Uh, most likely, it means that they were walking on a path, and the paths were narrow because the land was precious. You wanted to sow as much soil a seed as possible in the soil, so the paths were narrow, and so walking down a path, the disciples would easily be able to pluck the grain. Now, the Old Testament law said as long as you're walking through a field, you can pluck the grain and you can eat it. That's not against the law of Moses. But according to the teaching of the Pharisees, they didn't like that, and a couple of times uh, they called out Jesus' disciples for doing so, and even one time as they were walking on a Sabbath, they were walking along, pulling a few grains and eating it. You say, again, let's stick with our understanding of farming. In the early part of the season, the grain is soft. And you could pluck it and you could eat it. It was healthy. It was good protein. Last night for dinner, Betsy made me corn on the cob, and it was delicious. It's the season when corn is growing. Now we're starting to get near the end of that. But you know what? Come October or November, if she were to say, hey, I, I got some corn out of the field by the road, and I made some corn on the cob for you. I wouldn't want to eat it. Why? Because it was dry and hard. But in the springtime, in the early summer, we like corn on the cob. And in the spring and the summer, before harvest, when the grain was dried and hard, it was edible. And so the disciples were given permission by the law of Moses and blessed by being a disciple of Jesus as they walked. Sometimes they would take a bite. Now, there are a couple of principles as we go through that I simply want to point out to you. And here's one about the hardened soil. The sower was very intentional about where he planted or where he scattered the seed. We would say planting, uh, but in... The scenario and the explanation of the text, it was the sowing of the seed. They would not waste time and they would not waste the seed in throwing it on the path intentionally where it had no chance of growing. I wonder, I wonder if we have that kind of intentionality about where we scatter the spiritual seed. You see, the seed was good. The seed wasn't the problem. The problem was the soil. And some seed doesn't penetrate the soil because the soil had not been prepared to receive it. And so, listen, it fell on the soil, but it didn't get into the soil. And hear what Jesus is saying. That's a lost cause. That's wasted seed. As we walked along in Nazareth Village, sometimes Amir would just look down and he'd point and he'd say, this is the pathway that all of us walk on 
uh, you can see gardens and vineyards all around us here. He said, but we don't sow any seed here because this is the pathway on which we walk. And he took us to this passage. And so Jesus explains this spiritual lesson to his disciples in verse 19 when he says this. He says, whenever anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away that what has been sown in his heart. That is what was sown along the path. Now, we're talking here in two tenses. We're talking past tense, first century. But for you and I, we need to translate it to the here and now, which is the present tense and the future tense. Because the seed is the same. The sowers are different. It's a different generation. You and I are the sowers, but the seed is the same. And the soils are the same. But we want to be sure that we are trying to be intentional about sowing seed in places where the word of God can penetrate the hearts of people. Let's go to the second principle of the hardened soil. Our responsibility is to cultivate soil so that it is ready to receive the word of God. Okay? Back one slide, I believe. We need to cultivate the soil so that it's ready to receive the seed of God's word. Now, what do I mean by that? Again, let me just take a quick moment to explain it. I'm sharing my conviction with you, my personal conviction. Here and now, in our context where we live and serve, I believe that the gospel travels best over bridges of relationships. In other words, we live in a world today where we have to earn the right to be heard. There was a day in our not too distant past in our country, in many parts of the world, where there were mass crusades where people would come and hear and receive the word of God. That is usually not the way that people receive the gospel today. In traveling to Israel and Palestine now 20 times, each time I go, I'm working at building bridges of relationships with Muslim men in particular that love for me to come and sit with them and share a cup of Turkish coffee. And they will talk about Islam. They will talk about their Hajj, their, their spiritual journey, their spiritual pilgrimage to Mecca. And they will talk about their faith and their family. But I've had to work, I've had to work 25 years to build some of these relationships and earn the right to be heard with some of these men. That's what we mean by cultivating soil that is ready to receive the word of God. So let me just ask a personal question. Who are those unbelievers in your life that you are intentionally building bridges of relationships with for the purpose of, wanting to let them know you care about them and what you care most about is where they're going to spend eternity. Yes, indeed, care about what's going on here and now in their lives, but eternity is a lot longer than here and now. Well, we've got to move on to the rocky soil in 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6. And the rocky soil is described by Jesus in verses 5 and 6. He said, Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up 
since it had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Again, a mirror as we were walking around Nazareth Village. He would say, now I want you to bend down, and I just want you, in this area, he says, I want you to brush aside the dirt and tell me what's underneath. And we literally get our hands dirty and brush, and it didn't take long because under that thin layer of soil where we were walking in one part of Nazareth Village, we found that right underneath that was solid rock. Now, I don't, I don't want to give you a geography lesson here, but I'll tell you what, everything in Israel is either up or down, and the entire country the entire country is nothing but rock. And the soil that is there is so precious and it's guarded carefully. Now, that becomes deceptive sometimes for farmers. Because you can look at a field that looks like it's perfect. It looks like it would be great for plowing. And the moment you begin to put your plow in there and start to plow the field, you hit these huge rocks. It doesn't matter if you're in the north, you hit black balsack, uh, balsat uh, rock. Uh, it's volcanic rock. It's black. It doesn't matter if you're, you're in the mountainous regions on the sides. And they've learned how to cope with some of that with, with terracing. But in the valleys, that's really simply topsoil that has washed down from the mountains. But this rocky soil that Jesus is speaking of is common terrain because it looks good, but the soil is still rocky. And that's why you'll often find piles of rocks which mark boundaries in the areas where the seed is planted. It can be deceptive because of that thin layer of soil on top of the bedrock. And consequently... The seed is wasted if it's thrown on the rocky soil because it can never grow. And so what Jesus says in verses 20 and 21, as he unfolds the meaning of the parable to the disciples, he said, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears and immediately receives it with joy, and yet he has no root in himself. But he endures for a little while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, he immediately falls away. And the soil of this person's heart is, is immediately receptive to the seed, the spiritual seed, the truth of God's word, the gospel. But it's shallow. The roots go shallow because they're not doing anything to put down deeper roots. It's only superficial growth, but it shows no fruit. It can't grow. It doesn't grow. If I can... In 30 seconds, share some of my own personal testimony. I remember very clearly as a young child, um, about age nine, coming, uh, coming to know Christ. I understood very clearly uh, Jim Ayers was a sinner and needed a savior. As a boy of nine, that was a pretty big revelation. Okay? Uh, my family believed that if the church doors were open, you're there. Okay? However, it was a church that only was interested in preaching salvation messages. There was nothing about the maturity of growing up in the spiritual realm. There, there, there was nothing there. We, we may call it mentoring. We may call it discipleship. There were not the things in place to help someone grow. And so there were a lot of us in that church where we received the seed, 
but we didn't grow. And so I've got to be honest with you, uh, the, the years from age 9 to 19 were a deep void for me because I thought, I know Jesus, I'm going to heaven. I raised my hand, I walked an aisle, I prayed a prayer, I'm going to heaven. I thought that was just fire insurance. And I thought that was all there was to the Christian life. And so when I explained to my parents, I'm not going to church anymore, they said, oh, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. They said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. They said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. And then they said, you're not living in this house anymore. And so I left. A decade of my life, a decade of my life was lost. I'm not blaming anyone. Please understand that. I'm not blaming anyone except myself because I wasn't making any effort to personally grow. But until I met someone who said, wow, you are really missing out on what it means to live a fruitful life and growing in your faith, until I met someone like that, my life was very stagnant. And the seed had been sown, and I think initially it took root in the, in the rocky soil, but there was, there was nothing to indicate that I was a Christian. I was a churchgoer, but there was really no evidence of faithfulness or fruitfulness in my life. Well, here's a third principle for us related to the rocky soil. You see, perseverance in the faith is the best measure of a good harvest. And that's what Jesus said. He said, what happens when tribulation occurs and you have to persevere in your faith, the person who only has the rocky soil and the seed of the rocky soil, uh, there, there's no fruit. That, that's, that's not a good measure of a good harvest. And there was no fruit in my life during that period of time. Which brings us now to the third soil. The thorn-filled soil in verse 7. And very simply, this one speaks for itself. Other seeds, Jesus said in verse 7, fell among the thorns and thorns grew up and they choked them. Okay, now this is very important for us to understand. Here we see the competition between the seed and the weed. Because they both want the same nutrients out of the soil. They both want to flourish. They both want to grow. They both want to be productive. And so yesterday when I mowed my lawn, it looked very green. Now, if you're driving past my house quickly, you can say, oh, Jim's got a nice lawn. If you stop and look down, you'll see Jim doesn't have a very nice lawn. Jim does not use Scott's weed and feed. Half of Jim's lawn is weeds. The weeds and the grass are working against each other, trying to get the nourishment to grow, and right now the weeds are winning. Now, in the farming context, that's what Jesus said. In the thorn-filled soil... The thorn bushes were winning. The seed was not falling on, it was falling on good ground, but this battle that was going on underneath the soil could not support the ability for the seed to take root and produce fruit. And so what does Jesus say in verse 22? As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word of God but cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. You see the battle that's going on? The seed does take root and it lives, but it's not productive. It doesn't bear fruit, which is what its intention is. I fear 
I fear for many Christians that good activity, nothing morally wrong with it, has replaced God's activity, which bears fruit. And please don't take this, please don't interpret this as a cheap shot. It's simply, I'm, I'm 70 years old. I've been in ministry 50 years. So I, I've got five decades of observation. And I'm not boasting about that. I'm just simply saying I've, I've seen a lot of things. I've preached in a lot of churches. I've met with a lot of people. I've done a lot of counseling. And I'm concerned that there are a lot of programs in churches which overshadow God's purpose for the church. We're more interested in the programs than we are in God's purpose. Now, as a pastor, I could do something about that. Every year, our elders met with every ministry leader, and we said, what is the evidence of the fruit of your ministry? If there was none, that ministry was put to death. We weren't going to waste the seed. We weren't going to waste the resources. We weren't going to waste the time. We put the effort and the time and the resources into ministries which seemed to be more focused on the purpose of God's church. Where spiritual vitality dissipates, we're in trouble. Where traditions are elevated over truth, we're in trouble. Where sacred cows are still left standing instead of taken down and ground in the hamburger, we're in trouble. If we become content in our churches with simply rearranging the furniture on the deck of the Titanic, we're in trouble. If we spend our money trying to simply make ourselves comfortable, we're in trouble. And that was truly the situation that the church in Corinth was in. Now, we're not going to take time to turn because I'm already... um, on credit here with my time. <laughs> this is why I only get to uh, speak once at a lot of churches. <laughs> first Corinthians chapter three, read it on your own time, first nine verses. If you know anything about the letter to the, first, to the Corinthians, that first letter, you know that Paul just marches right through issue after issue after issue and said, we got a, this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, and you've got to deal with it. Church of Corinth. And in first chapter first Corinthians chapter three, verses one and nine, this is one of the, these are quotes. You can read them for yourself. He says, number one, you're mere infants in Christ. By now, by now you should be grown ups, and you're still taking a bottle like a baby. You're still eating formula instead of wrestling with the, the truth and the deeper things of God. He says there's jealousy and quarreling among you. There's division in the church over things that don't really matter in the scope of building the kingdom of God. And then thirdly, he says in chapter 3, he says, you're following men, not God. These are things which are thorns which keep the seed from really flourishing. So what do we have to do? Well, we've got to put our work gloves back on and start pulling out those thorn bushes, start removing the weeds. And that's a long process and a hard process. It's hard work. So the principle that I'd like to leave with you here for the thorn-filled soil is this. When fruitlessness is the norm, you need to determine why. When fruitless, I know why grass isn't growing on my yard. I just have not done anything about it yet. I believe God wants every church to grow. And I don't, I don't think it's moving from one sheep pen to another. I think we have the responsibility of sowing seed, of reaping a harvest, of seeing faith, And disciples multiply. That's how the church grows. God wants us to be fruitful in every age, in every stage of our lives. And if we aren't, then we need to find out personally. We need to look in the mirror and say, if I'm not bearing fruit, why not? 
what's choking out the work of the Spirit of God in my life? He told the Galatians he didn't hold anything back. He said, um, you know, there's a fruit of the Spirit that is a, a way that we test to see if the Spirit is really at work in your life. Now, when I was thinking about this choking, I, I remember an occasion where we were at a family gathering and my father, I, I saw he was coughing. He had turned his back and uh, as my dad would because he was rather uh, shy. But uh, I heard him choking, coughing, and walked over to him, turned him around, his face was blue. He clearly was choking. And so I grabbed him, and you know what I did? I did the, the Heimlich, okay? And food flew out of his mouth, and he started to breathe well. You know what I'm suggesting this morning? We need a holy Heimlich in our churches. Quote me on that. We need a holy Heimlich to get rid of the things in our life which are literally choking the reproductive spiritual life out of us. Lastly is the good soil. Verses 8 and 9. Other seeds, Jesus said, fell on good soil, produced grain, some 100, some 60, some 30. And then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He repeats it again in verse 23. As for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word of God and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another case sixtyfold, in another thirty. Wow, that's a great return. If I told you this morning, give me one dollar today and a year from now I'll be back and give each of you a hundred dollar bill, you'd be lining up like crazy instead of bolting for the door. If I told you, give me a dollar, and next year I'll give you 60 bucks for every dollar you give me, you'd be lining up for that kind of investment. If I told you, I can triple 30%, I can see your Roths, your IRAs, your 401ks, I can see them go up 30% in a year, you'd be lining up saying, how is that? How, how, what's the name of your investor? You see, that's what Jesus was trying to get at. Jesus is interested in seeing the multiplication of the seed. Because principle five tells us that God cares about an abundant spiritual harvest. That's why when Jesus would look out over a grain field, again, the visual picture of that, he looked at the harvest of that particular field. And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. And he says, therefore, send earnestly. He says, send out laborers into the field. So the question becomes, where are the laborers? Well, that's us. It, Initially, he was trying to explain this to the disciples, but the disciples then became the apostles, and the apostles were the founders of the church, and the church is us. You and I as individuals, and we are involved in sowing seed in a lot of different areas. But here's my last principle, number six. Every seed which bears fruit, now think about this, Every seed that bears fruit gives birth to another sower. So every time I have the opportunity to lead someone to Christ, I have been involved in the process of sowing seed and caring for the soil and fertilizing the soil and pulling the weeds and being blessed in the harvest and watching another sower who has come to faith who can produce another hundredfold, sixtyfold, or thirtyfold. Now I'm going to close with this illustration. My daughter-in-law 
was a Jehovah's Witness. And when I first met her, she wasn't my daughter-in-law, but she and my son were very close. And she said she had a lot of questions. Um, never in my life uh, had I met anyone like her. She was very sensitive, very caring, uh, and very serious about her questions. And she said, could we get together and have some questions? Uh, is quest questions and answers. And I said, well, certainly, let's do that. She showed up with a legal pad that had three pages of questions on it. And over the months when I was down in Florida visiting my son, we went through all of her questions, one by one by one by one. We got to the end of the list, and I said, what else? Jokingly, I said, is that all you got? And do um, you have any questions? No? And I gave her some materials. I gave her some passages. And I said, these are some of the things we talked about. I said, these are things that you want to go back and review. I said, if you have any questions, just give me a call. A few days pass. I come home back to Pennsylvania. I give Kate a call. And I said, Kate, um, you know, I'm just curious. Uh, any, any follow-up questions after I left? She said, no. She said, I, I, as a matter of fact, she said, I got up early this morning. I went, uh, went down to the beach. And uh, she said, I was sitting there. And she said, I remember you told me that, that praying was just like having a conversation with God. And I said, that's right. I said, we treat him with respect when we talk with God uh, because he's holy. But, but we have a conversation with him. That's what prayer is. And she said, well, that's what I did this morning. And she said, I, I told God. Um, that I understood that I was a sinner and I needed a savior, not just the religion that I grew up with. And she said, I just was talking out loud to God and I asked God to forgive my sin and told him I wanted to offer him my life. And she said, Dad, did I do it right? <laughs> In tears, I said, yeah. Now, fast forward nearly 10 years. Every time I go to Florida, Kate has a Bible study with young women who she both works with and who she is discipling in the AA program. She's in addiction recovery. So is my youngest son. They're both investing in other people. She has a Bible study. Sometimes they'll call me in the middle of the Bible study. And she'll say, Dad, you're on speakerphone. We have questions. And then it got to be, she said, Dad, when are you coming down the next time? Okay. She said, we're just going to, we've got a whiteboard here and sticky notes. And she said, anytime we come across something that we don't know what to do or how to respond to it, or I can't answer it. She said, we try to do the best we can to study it. And she said, but then we just write it and put it on the sticky board. And the top says, questions for Dad. <laughs> and so whenever I go down, I go to this women's Bible study. And I spend hours with these women who are just searching. And all I'm doing is just trying to plant seeds, pull weeds, and praying for a harvest. I guess what I'm asking us to do is, in our, in our current situation, and I have no idea, again, this is, this is not a judgment in any way against your church, but I think we, we as a Christian people at a period of time in our culture where we're losing influence in our culture. And we need to work at building bridges of relationships with people because I didn't see a whole flock of unbelievers who were waiting outside this morning to come into the church. My best friend is uh, head of a mission I won't tell you which one. He's traveling all around the world. This is his first year. And he said, Jim, he said, I'm stunned. He said, they only work with indigenous groups. They only have one missionary to those groups or one missionary family who can help train the leaders. And he said, you know who's doing the work 
in these countries around the world. They're in more than 60 countries around the world. He said, you know who's doing the work of preaching the gospel and building churches, planting churches? He said, teenagers. Teenagers. He said, every country I go to, I see the same thing. He said, God is doing a new thing. And we as churches need to figure out how we can be a better part of it. That means we need to rethink evangelism. We need to rethink missions. And we need to rethink, and this is the one that really hurts, we need to really rethink where are we putting our time and effort into this church, your church, and you as individuals are the church. I'm way over my time. I confess that is sin, <laughs> but I'm really not apologizing for it. I want to close in prayer. I think, Jules, are you still going to come up and lead us in? A, okay, make your way up. Could I just have a moment and just pray with you, please, as we close? Father God, um, boy, and there, there's not a one of us who's here this morning who would say that we're perfect. We don't, we don't have all the answers to everything. We're, we're trying to learn. We're trying to grow. But, Father, maybe it's just time where you want us to look into the mirror and you want us to do the, the test of the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5. And, and do we see fruit in our lives? Do we see the Spirit of God working in us and through us? Are we being intentional with that person across the street, with that person who that we work, we work with, that relative, these individuals who cross our paths randomly, who we're invited into their life for whatever the reason. Are we intentional about trying to, to be the best version of Jesus that they have ever seen? May it be so in our lives, in our church, and in our intentional efforts to make Christ known as we work at being good sowers because we know there's nothing wrong with the seed but make us more attentive to the soil to make sure that we're doing everything within our ability to see a harvest. We pray this not for our glory but so that the kingdom of God may grow. And so we ask it boldly in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.